All right, so what's the answer to that question? The answer is uh, what's called adaptive dispersion theory. Uh, so this is a theory developed by a couple of Swedish linguists named Bjorn Lindblom and Johan Lilienkrantz back in the 70s. Uh, so it may be coincidental that they're Swedish speakers, it may not. Um, but what this uh, theory says is that languages tend to maximize the distance between vowels in acoustic space uh, to help listeners perceive contrast between vowels. So the answer to the question of why um, <clears throat> do we not get uh, five vowels all kind of clustered together in one part of the space is that it's harder to keep them distinct that way. It's harder for a listener to hear the difference between them. And in, you can also think about it like there's all this other space like in the vowel space that people, speakers wouldn't even be using in that case. Like why just glom them all over there in the corner when they could just branch out, right? Uh, spread their wings and, and fly over to the you know low back corner of the space. Uh, another way to think about that um, is uh, like if you get onto an elevator, uh, it's not likely that if there are five people who all get on an elevator at the same time, that they all kind of cluster around one corner really close to each other. Uh, everybody kind of tries to like maintain a little bit of personal space around themselves when they do that. Um, and especially in the age of the coronavirus, we're all trying to sort of maintain physical distance. Uh, so um, you can think about it that way maybe too. Uh, that's more for um, survival reasons. Uh, this is more for just um, communication reasons. So the idea is that when you say something, you want people to understand what you hear or what you say. Uh, and in order for them to be able to do that, you have to make what you say distinct from other things that you might be saying. Um, so this is about perception. Uh, and this is kind of related to an interesting phonological phenomenon um, called chain shifting, uh, which is that when you do mess around with uh, a vowel system in some way, if you do move one element of it around, then other elements of that system will kind of have to adjust to sort of maintain a fair amount of distance so that you can understand what's being said. Um, so I've got a few examples of this. Um, there's one chain shift, uh, which people have um, noted is taking place in the northern United States or maybe taken place it's um complete uh because i don't know to what extent this is still spreading uh so this um like i said in the previous lecture i grew up in minnesota i went to college in california i went to high school in uh, the, the suburbs of chicago uh, and then i also spent a year in illinois um again when i was uh kind of bouncing around the academic world before i landed in calgary uh so this is something i uh definitely noticed when i lived in chicago uh it's this is a kind of um, aspect of vowel production, which is prevalent in uh, what are called the Great Lakes cities uh, in the US. So Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo, uh, Milwaukee, so on and so forth, all kind of clustered around the southern perimeter of the Great Lakes. Uh, you don't, interestingly enough, get it really in um, Toronto. Uh, I haven't met many people from Windsor, Ontario, which is right across the river from Detroit, but um, I have met uh, at least one person there who had the shift there too. So um, to a certain extent, it might just be an American versus Canadian thing. Uh, so I don't want to get too general with the Great Lakes idea, but that's that's what it's normally called. Uh, so this is uh, an example clip uh, from a radio show called This American Life of a couple of cops eating in a restaurant in Chicago. And this definitely brings me back to my high school days whenever I hear it. Oh, no. I know. I come in here all the time. I used to know 2971 Lincoln. Mike is always hanging around and uh, there's, well, Bob over there sitting on the end. Hey, Bob, how you doing? Donna, Mary, Dave, the one cab driver. I've come here quite a bit. Hey, Bob, how are you doing? Uh, that sort of thing is really nice. Uh, but this is broader than just um, Chicago. Uh, and I'll give you the sort of characteristics of what the vowels are doing. Uh, so uh, one part of this shift is, uh, so like I said, if you move one part of a vowel system, then the other vowels kind of have to compensate to make sure that they're still understood. Uh, so if it, something gets pushed out of place, it kind of winds up being like musical chairs for the vowels. They have to all move around. Uh, so, um, one theory is that the first vowel that started moving around is a vowel, um, which became more like a or e in uh, the Great Lakes uh, cities. Uh, here's another example from, um, I think there's actually another policeman from Wisconsin, if I remember where I got this clip from correctly. We actually tried to get his attention a few times because he was playing. So, I mean, he was happy to be in there, but uh, I don't think mom and dad were too happy. Yeah, so the first time he says happy, he doesn't say happy. He says happy. Uh, I'll play it again in case you couldn't hear it. We actually tried to get his attention a few times because he was playing. So, I mean, he was happy to be in there, but uh, I don't think mom and dad were too happy. Okay, so if you move a ah in the direction of a eh or a, eh, uh, what happens to the other vowels? Uh, well, there's 
first of all, there's kind of space left behind for the a, ah, so this ah vowel can move forward. And so bod wouldn't be bod, but like bad, bad, dana, rather than donna. Um, bod, if you have a distinction like this, bod becomes ah, unrounded. Uh, and then there's space left behind where you might have had ah before, so bus becomes boss, uh, bod becomes bod, bod becomes bad, bad becomes bad. Uh, and I think there's one la last element of the shift, which is a eh becomes a, uh, so bed becomes bud. Uh, and this one always kind of strikes me as the oddest part of this, uh, but it's not that odd because uh, we actually sh see this in um, sort of a broader variety of English uh, in the word like 20, uh, like the numeral 20. Uh, not many people say 20 for that. You often hear 20. Uh, so that's epsilon shoving back to wedge 20. Um, okay, so what you might not have seen on this previous just list of shifts is what's going on here. Uh, and they're all, like I said, kind of music, moving around in musical chairs. So A ah moves up here. Uh, A is going to move back to kind of get out of the way. Wedge is going to move back here. That's going to move back here, front here, and this is going to move front here. So you, vowels kind of all wind up in the same place as they were before, but they're not where they started out. So this whole thing gets shifted around based on how um, other speakers of English might say the same vowels. Uh, but they all kind of have to maintain that dis distance from each other in the vowel space to be done understood. That's adaptive dispersion theory. Um, the adaptive part of adaptive dispersion theory, by the way, it, adaptive means that the system can change over time, like in evolution. Uh, and dispersion just means that they have to sort of maintain distance. Um, and that when they adapt, they disperse as they adapt. Uh, so I have some old samples from when I was teaching in Illinois. Uh, this is the when I had people do the production exercise that I'm going to have you guys do. So this is the word HOD, which you might say is HOD. HOD. Like that. But if you front that vowel, it sounds more like this. HOD. HOD. So that's pretty characteristic of uh, people from the Chicago area. Uh, another characteristic is ag gets raised, so had might sound like had to you. Had. Uh, but if you raise it a bit. Had. 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 It sounds more like that. Um, and I've got one example of the epsilon backing for the word ahead. 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 Uh, something like that. Ahead. Uh, where this epsilon sounds a little bit more like a wedge. Okay. Um, there is... By contrast, um, kind of a different uh, series of shifts, which you can often hear in Canadian English, uh, or maybe you just produce the vowel in hod, uh, not as a low back unrounded vowel, pod, uh, but as something more like that open O, or may maybe at least a rounded aw. Hod. Hod. Um, maybe you can hear this one okay. Hod. Hod versus pod. Hod. Um, so you hear that sort of shift more often in Canadian English. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of this fronted OO, which I said uh, or mentioned at the start of this lecture is fairly common in a wide variety of English dialects. Hood. That's a nice back one. Here's a nice front one. Hood. Hood versus Hood. Hood. Um, yeah, so. Oh, yeah, I'll give you another example. I'll talk a little bit more about the Canadian vowels in a second. Um, but uh, New Zealand uh, kind of has a similar set of uh, shifts in their vowels. When, I guess maybe when you get a lot of vowels like you do in English, uh, it's hard to get them to stay put, or at least if one moves, a whole bunch of other things have to move to get out of the way. Uh, so in New Zealand, the I becomes more centralized. So it's maybe something like I, I or maybe this vowel. Insects. So that's the word insects, but it's more like insects. Insects. Uh, and I think you heard these back uh, when I was still out uh, at the beginning of the semester. But so I has moved to become central. So I can move up to uh, get into is former space. End. End, as opposed to end. Uh, and then I believe that I actually moves up to be more like um, I here. And uh, hopefully. End. Um, 
you guys saw that Flight of the Concords clip when I was away. Uh, I'm not going to play it in case somebody on YouTube actually looks at these things to make sure they're not violating copyrights. But Brett introduces himself as Brit. Uh, and that leads to all sorts of hilarious confusion with a speaker of American English. Uh, yeah, so this leads me to what's going on with Canadian English. Again, this is stuff you hopefully saw at the beginning of the semester and maybe have forgotten about, but um, the vowels of uh, Canadian English um, are not always the same as their American counterparts. So, ah uh, might be aw. Uh. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for her brother Bob. That's actually a more extreme example. That's ah uh, becoming like an open O. Fourth brother Bob. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for her brother Bob. Um, and this is an unshifted uh, variety from. So this speaker, I think, is from Saskatoon. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five Six thick slabs of, of fresh blue cheese, peas, and maybe a snack five for her thick brother slabs Bob. Of blue cheese, All right, and maybe a snack for her brother Bob. Everything's falling apart here. It's not just the world. It's this lecture. All right. So uh, here's the unshifted variety. This speaker is from Saskatoon. This speaker is from Calgary. So you may or may not do this yourself. Six spoons of fresh snow peas, five thick slabs of blue cheese, and maybe a snack for her brother, Bob. Bob. Uh, so another characteristic of Canadian English is a ah, vowel often becomes a little bit lower and backers more like ah. I usually spoke about half a pack a day. Half a pack a day. Um, I would say it like this. I usually smoke about half a pack a day. Half a pack a day. Uh, so this is a more American characteristic. This is more Canadian. Um, there are also some newer shifts underway, which are kind of fascinating. So this ah um, has kind of moved. Out. So, so like if ah, low back vowels kind of moved out of the way a little bit to become more rounded, a little bit, uh, which shifts its form it's lower. Um, this might move into the space uh, vacated by that. And then this vowel eh might move into the space vacated by that. Head. And. Bed. Bed, as opposed to. Head. Head. Uh, and then if uh, epsilon is shifted, why doesn't I shift to be in its place? Head. And these are samples I've recorded from students who did this production exercise in the past. Bid. Yeah, so this is the unshifted. Bid. This is the shifted. Head. And this one should sound. Head. Like this one. Bed. More or less. Uh, and then one that I haven't seen documented too much, but uh, I've noticed is that this U becomes sort of like a rounded schwa or maybe a uh, low mid front rounded vowel. Uh, this is what it sounds like in the unshifted Friday. Hood. Uh, if it's shifted. Hood. 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 Something like that. So it's going kind of uh, forwards into space. And I don't need to point randomly. I can just kind of show these to you. Uh, and what's, well, I'll play them all and maybe you can see the pattern as I do. Bid, head, bed, head, half, half, bob, bob, spoon, spoons, hood, head. Okay, so um, all these shifts are kind of moving in this counterclockwise direction, which is kind of interesting. So if we go back just a step um, to the Great Lake shift, all of these shifts were in the clockwise direction and all the Canadian shifts are in a counterclockwise direction. So it's kind of the opposite pattern of what we get um, across the border, right? Which is kind of funny. So uh, maybe Canadians are trying harder to sound not like Americans who can blame them, right? Uh, but uh, either way, um, there's a systematic pattern that we can find in the vowel shifts all together. Uh, and I often talk about uh, like when I was a kid, people used to say, well, you know, we have all these mass communications across the uh, the world now, and we have radio and TV, and eventually it led to internet and other things. Um, and uh, maybe all of us will just start sounding like each other um, as we go. Uh, that's not really happening. We're actually sounding a little bit more unlike each other as we go. Yeah, who can predict what humans will do next? Uh, even though that's our job, it's not easy to do. Um, and I'll walk you through one more set of slides here before we're done today.